Dialogue and Creativity features Douglas Harding, the eminent spiritual teacher and author, who has been in this country recently to hold a series of workshops and talks on the question, who I really am. Also with us is a community development worker who has worked, ex worked extensively in remote areas with remote communities, Michael Adams. I am Cribben Pillay from the Department of Drama, University of Durban West Hall. Douglas, my first question to you on this issue of creativity really relates to something that you so beautifully put about Shakespeare, and that Shakespeare, in Measure for Measure, Act 2, Scene 2, starting, I think, line 117, lets the cat out of the bag by referring to the source of his creativity. Um, would you be so kind as to quote those lines, Douglas? Well, several lines. I hope I shall remember them. <clears throat> yes, and uh, perhaps you will remind me if I forget a line here. Um, it starts like this. Man, proud man, dressed in a little brief authority, most ignorant of what is most assured, his glassy essence, like an angry ape, plays such tricks before high heaven as make the angels weep. So what Shakespeare is saying really is that I have a choice really uh, of uh, seeing who I really am, looking into my glassy essence, which means I think my transparency, my no-thingness, my space here, I have a choice of doing that, uh, or risking behaving like an angry ape. And so we not only have here, I think, um, the secret of Shakespeare's creativity, but uh, going far beyond that, really, uh, the uh, alternative proposed to us of shall we see who we really really are because it's totally available we, we, we are assured of it we have a choice of doing that or behaving like angry apes well you could say I suppose that angry apes are not, uh, really it's unfair to apes of course but angry apes or apes of any kind are not too creative are they but when you see who you really really are uh, then uh, you will not make the angels weep, and the apes, uh, you will be transcending your ape nature. So that is the, the quotation from Measure for Measure. Uh, Douglas, this is central to your, your teaching. Uh, who am I really? Yes. What is my real nature? Yes. And somehow I get the feel that if that is uh, discovered, Yes. Um, experienced, then we are actually tapping into the source of all creation. Yes. Um, but how practical is this? And, and, and what do you mean by seeing into one's nature? And what indeed do we mean by, by creativity? Yes. I wonder whether yes. we could start with this question of uh, what creativity really is. I mean, that's the subject of this conversation. And uh, I would suggest that creativity means the arrival of something unpredictable, something new, something new in the world. Uh, of course, it's got many, many connections with the old, but in important respects, it is breaking with the old and discovering that which could not be predicted from the old, which is a surprise, an astonishment, a revelation. And that can only be uh, from the end, it, 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 to a certain extent anyway, from the ending of the old and uh, starting fresh, making a fresh start from nothing. Look, the old comes to an end. And if it doesn't, it's, it's not creative. It, 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 the next move is not creative. It's a furthering of the old stuff. Well, the, the, certainly the old stuff is reflected in, in the new stuff, but there is an essential element in the new stuff 
of, of that which could not be predicted, which is inspirational, uh, which, as you suggest, is coming from the source here. And we shall need to uh, look at the source to check what uh, Shakespeare says about his availability, have a look into it now, or presently have a look into it for ourselves, really experience this, this place we're coming from, uh, where the new uh, can arrive because the old has packed it in. And I, I think it's not also, it's also that it isn't something that you need to just practice for its own sake, but Creativity is really a response, a flexible response to a new situation. Which is always happening. Mark. The new situation is always happening. Therefore, you have to come up with a new response. Which That's right. Can't come Creativity is not just for special moments in a studio, in, a, in, a, in an artist's studio, or, you know, composing on the piano, or writing a, a book of poetry. Creativity is or should be the very hallmark of our lives. Because every situation is unique, isn't it? I mean, I've ne we've never met before in this situation. It's no situation. And inviting creativity. So creativity is the very stuff of our life. Isn't it, Michael? Yeah, and it's how you respond if the car breaks down. It's uh, if you decide that you can get out and fix it, perhaps what, with a safety pin, well, then that's creative. Well, that's if creative. Instead, <laughs> <laughs> if yes. instead you panic and... Uh, thumb a ride and leave your car there and it gets uh, stripped to bits by burglars, it wasn't a very creative move. Well, you can't always judge creativity by its for success, financial or popular. Sometimes creativity can be very uncomfortable in its, in its fruits. But I think a mark of it is that it, it, ha it not only is new, or it contains element of the new, but the, there is in this new the seed of something which could grow and flourish. I mean, just to be new, after, after all, is not uh, uh, creative. I mean, I can get a heap of uh, garbage and make a pattern on the floor, which is a new pattern. But it ain't very helpful, is it? Or I can talk gibberish, that's new. You know, one can do that. Talk is all nonsense talk. And uh, that's not very helpful. That's new, but it's not creative. So there's an element in the new which is uh, uh, potentially fruitful. Would you agree with that? You, yeah, you seem to be um, pointing to um, this creativity actually being a state of being. Well, I think, I, I think, Ribbon, that it, 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 it's only, not only a state of being, it's our true nature. But we veiled it by convention, by subservience to the old, by over-fixation on the old, by habit, 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 the, the deadening effect of uh, custom and habit and fear to be different. I mean, fear to be different. We fear to stand out. We're inviting trouble, perhaps. We're inviting criticism. We don't like to stand up and be counted and say something new in case we get knocked on the head, you see. And uh, uh, so there are all sorts of ways of, of avoiding uh, our true nature, which I say is essentially creative. And the environment is, isn't actually uh, a, con a very controlling factor on your creativity. You may be living under a repressive regime, but if you're not afraid, the, creat the creative factor is well, the one I... that finds a way of expressing yourself within those confines. Oh, hopefully, yes. Yeah. And sometimes very difficult uh, circumstances are exactly what the doctor ordered for creativity. Mm. In fact, I think in the history of man, the most creative periods in the, in the history of our funny old species have been times of very great social difficulty. Mm. I mean, what, what could be more creative than Athens, what, 500 years before Christ? Uh, 600 years before Christ, you know, I mean, at, at war with the other city-states, a, a, a tiny community threatened um, from outside in many directions. I mean, the, the, we, are, we are the fruit of that enormous creative thing in Athens of the time, Pericles, and then in Renaissance Italy with, you know, Dante and, and, and the great uh, the beginners of science, 
and a superb artists like Michelangelo and Leonardo and so on. I mean, why? It was a time, a time when those city-states were being horrible to one another. The whole thing to do with society was dangerous in, in, a, in a very, very difficult state. But my gosh, what creativity. Elizabethan England, similarly. So I think you're right. I think that uh, difficult times, and I think we all know about that, difficult times, if, if they're not... It, well, I don't know who, whether you can say they shouldn't be too difficult, but certainly difficult times uh, can be very promising for creativity. Um, Douglas, before we um, go on to look more practically into um, how one can actually have an entree into this Oh, source. we need to do, talk about um, I think we need to also just um, clarify for ourselves and open up what seems to be a current direction uh, in regard to this whole business of creativity. And that is um, creativity is seen as a means to an end, and the end is always some product, something that we can consume. So if I um, create a, a good TV sitcom, um, then I'm regarded as creative. If I write a play, a poem, um, a piece of music, create a piece of music, um, then uh, society applauds that as, as the hallmarks, as it were, of creativity. But I think we're missing something in, in, in that kind of attitude, because very often um, it's not creativity, from, from my own sense of it, it's very often a putting together in slightly different ways, uh, old things, and calling it one's own, calling it uh, creative. And the other thing is, um, especially now uh, in, in colleges and universities, there is this uh, wave of interest in the left brain and the right brain. And um, we all know the theories that the left brain is concerned with um, the logical, verbal, analytical sides of ourselves, and the right brain is concerned with the more intuitive, uh, the more creative, holistic aspects. Um, but there seems to be something artificial as well about that movement because it is getting people into, into a workshop, into an environment and saying, right, we're now going to stimulate the right brain. And yes, indeed, <clears throat> um, you can get a group, and I've done this many times, to create a fairly nice poem or to create uh, the beginnings of a play. But the, the students or participants in the workshop leave um, and there's no real fundamental transformation or no real fundamental insight. They simply have finally what amounts to a gimmick to, to produce something. And I'm almost certain that after a while that would become um, a habit and they would lose it. And then they need something else to stimulate them. So could we just talk about this whole business of the left brain and the right brain, lateral thinking, all these various methods to bring about um, creative perception, uh, creative um, actions? Well, I think we uh, uh, hinted on the uh, answer to that question right at the beginning, when you said something about the uh, uh, experience of who we really are. And uh, I think that gets to the root of the matter. Uh, if I in ignorance of who I am, imagining I know who I am, when I, in fact I don't know anything of the kind, uh, and then getting together and say, oh, I've got, I'm going to be creative, I'm going to be creative, is it, it, really not going to work terribly well, I do agree with you. And I think creativity is, is to some extent a byproduct of something else. And it's a byproduct of being ourself, our genuine self, and uh, living from, experiencing from, our uh, center, our true nature, uh, uh, authentically from our direct experience of ourself, uh, right here is who we are, and not from uh, what society tells me I am, uh, looking at me from outside. Nobody out there is in a position to tell me what I'm like here. And we all, I mean, all in our lives, we all allowed ourselves, didn't we, to tell uh, uh, to take 
uh, what other people are saying about us here as the truth. And of course, there'll be the people uh, out there too far away to know what I am like here. And I am too far away from you uh, to tell you what you're like there. And we, each of us have to dare to be our own authority at center. Now, that, I think, gets the heart and the root of creativity because it's the genuine coming from what we are. And uh, this, uh, given a chance, is naturally creative. Would you say that um, whatever potential is latent in the uh, organism uh, actually is allowed to flourish much more naturally as a result of uh, yes. this understanding, this experiential understanding of who I really am? Yes, uh, or, or, or vision of who I really am. Then I think that everything I do has got a kind of perfume, a kind of feel of authenticity, and not the feel or perfume or stink, should I say, <laughs> stink of, of habit, of, 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 you know, of reliance on everything I'm told, the media tells me, the language tells me, and there's nothing authentic about me at all because I'm taking all my cues from outside, none from here. And I'm no authentic person. But when I, when I really see who I am, not, not, I not understand so much, I would say, but really see who I am, uh, then I think I tap the, the, the resources which are indeed infinite and are always coming up with a new. Oh, an objection, though, um, Douglas, to this um, that might uh, assail quite a few people is that there is a culture, especially now with Eastern um, philosophies and religions having come to the West, that we've got to work for this and it's attainable sometime in the future. Yes. Um, so I'm going to, through some practice or the other, some meditation, uh, whatever it is, I'm going to work at this, uh, in order to arrive at this vision, this understanding, and then there will be creativity. Yes. But you radically oppose that, don't you? Well, uh, I, um, I would simply say I agree with Shakespeare that this, uh, we are most assured of it. If we look in the right place at the right time and the right spirit, uh, the right place being right here, in my case, and the right place being right there where you, the viewer, are, if we look in this place, uh, uh, is then uh, this is unavoidable, this glassy essence. In other words, a transparent awakeness, shall we say, uh, the root of my nature, the deepest part of me, which is transparent to inspection. Well, that is totally available when I look here in the right place. And, and, and uh, when shall I look? Not in the future when I train myself to do this, that, and the other, which is putting the thing off endlessly. It's right now, it's available now. At three o'clock here in Denver, it's, it's absolutely available now. So we look here, we look now, and what, in what spirit do we look? We look in the spirit of a, I'd say, an intelligent child before that child gets run over, you know, and macerated, macerated and impregnated with all the indoctrination of um, language, society, parents, teachers, and all that, and has become inauthentic, imitative, that's the great thing, imitative, and not original. But a child, in the sense, that doesn't have the same sense of the need for self-inquiry at all. No. It's not it's, looking. At no, it's not a conscious, uh, conscious resting in his or her uh, transparency, uh, it, but it's a living from it, though. That's why I think children, you know, children come up with, yes, take painting, painting, very good example. I, 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 I'm very interested in painting, I've done it a lot myself, and drawing, and uh, I agree with some people who have said that the drawings of a child of two, three, four, five, like that, are Picasso-like, you know, in, the, in their originality. They, they've always got a freshness. I've seen one or two drawings in your house by your uh, son, Corin, which I, I think I'd love to have done that. 
Uh, I mean, I, I think when you get to his age now, you're getting imitative, of course, and you copy things from books and so on. So on. But I think the drawings of a young child, I, I, I would not be, if I were Picasso, I'd not be ashamed to put my name to them. And then you see the, 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 the blight of habit, convention, imitation comes and, and uh, the, the drawings are inspired no longer, dull as ditch water, imitative, derivative. But um, doubtless this uh, seeing who I really am, seeing my glassy essence, my transparency, is it a matter of intellection, of coming to it via thought? Or is it a totally different process? Well, we must do, them, do it and see. I, 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 I don't find I can think it. Or I can think it, but it's absolutely no good. It doesn't get me home, you know. Uh, I've got to actually see it. And it, 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 it is visible, this uh, source. In fact, the joke is that, uh, uh, I think the joke is that it's been said down the ages by people who didn't know and assumed by a great majority of people that uh, the source, this source of inspiration, call it spirit, call it uh, glassy essence, give it a religious name like uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven, Atman, Brahman, Allah, the muses in Greek uh, uh, mythology, in theology, uh, is that um, this is really inaccessible inaccessible and I can see things in the world perfectly clearly I can see myself in the mirror perfectly clearly I can see you and Michael now at this time and the studio and so on everything is revealed to me out there more or less revealed to me but who I really really am here is not accessible and I find exactly the opposite and Shakespeare in that quotation from measure for measure says he says we are most ignorant of what we're most assured well, in other words, have a look, and they've got it. And we, we must do that. We must do that because, well, for more than, more than one reason, I think we must do that. Not only to tap the sources of our creativity, uh, not only to tap the, the energy, the place where we're coming from, which is energizing, surely, um, but uh, I think just because we ha have happened. Come on. It, 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 how chicken-hearted, how feeble-minded, how wretched it is to live and die and, and, and never have a look who's doing that. I mean, I'm, I've happened. I'm, I'm damned if I'm going to live and die without having a look at what's happened. So now, every kind of motive for looking to see who I am, a creativity advertised by Shakespeare and other great ones to be available right here and, and, and transparent, and accessible. Uh, uh, secondly, I've happened, I'm thankful as having happened, and I'm jolly well going to look at what's happened. And thirdly, the great religions of the world and some psychologists tell me that um, uh, uh, it, 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 it is really true that who I am here, at, uh, uh, no distance from myself, who I really, really, really am, is not uh, a human being at all, and if I want to know uh, what I'm like, I look in the mirror and say, in all respects, I'm the opposite of the one in the mirror. That one is small, this one is big. That one is solid, this one is, as Shakespeare says, transparent, glassy. Uh, that one is opaque, and then this one is uh, transparent. Um, that one uh, is unbounded. I'm sorry, this one is unbounded. The little guy I see in my mirror is bounded. So we have to look here, uh, because uh, I suggest we have to look here if we want to uh, do ourselves a kindness because the great religions, every one of them, has said that where we're coming from right here is our cure. It is our comfort, it is our assurance of eternal felicity, and it is above all imperishable. So, we, and we've got all those motives for looking to see where we're coming from. And I would add one of sheer fun. I mean, I, I don't think you know what fun is until you look and see who you are. It's so amusing, I think, and refreshing. Douglas, we can have some problem, perhaps, with using the word look, because if I were to look at myself, the way I imagine it quite simply is somehow taking my head off already, 
putting it out there, using my eyes to look back here <laughs> where my head used to be. Oh, well, that's a funny one, isn't it? The looking, it is, when you say looking, well, I, we're not I, going to look with our eyes. Well, come on, let, let This let. way, are we? Well, uh, uh, you see, uh, 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 I think that looking at what you're looking out of, Michael, is easier than looking at what you're looking at. Now, for me, I'm looking at Michael and uh, uh, looking that way, and I can more or less see Michael, although I don't take in all that incredible rugged terrain and all the details of your beard and shirt. I could kind of glimpse you there. But I can also see what I'm looking out of. And that is, is not like that, it's space for that. I'm looking out of this awake capacity, this glassy essence. And it's perfectly easy to see what I'm looking out of if we look in the right place. So before we, you know, discuss it any further, let's do it. Shall I, shall I feel what I'm looking out no, of? No, it's not a feeling and it's not a thinking. It's a looking. And it, it, to see what we're looking out of is perfectly simple. I, I quote sometimes uh, Rainer Maria Rilke, the German, a great German poet, uh, early in the century, and he said, and we spectators always, always looking at things. Never at, at the looker. Never at what we're looking out of. Who's turned us round like this? Isn't it easy to see what you're looking out of? For example, are you looking out of two eyes in your own experience now? I mean, come on, you can see how many eyes you're looking out of in your own experience there. No, I'm not looking out of two eyes. You're not? I'm looking at. You're looking at, Douglas. What are you looking out of? I'm looking out of nothing. Well, then you're seeing that there's nothing here in Douglas's way. I know that I'm looking out of nothing because uh, there is, I have no other evidence. There's no evidence here which isn't really based on looking, is it? It's based on absence. Well, based on seeing absence. And you see Douglas's face, and you see there, I guess, there's nothing there to keep Douglas's face out with, have you? And you're the one with the white beard now, and I'm the one with the pepper and salt beard. beard. Why am I you in that case? Well, I'm talking about our appearances now. Uh, yes, yeah, so why am I... Your... Well, I suggest that you and I are trading faces at this time. If we drop memory and drop imagination and drop prejudice and belief and nonsense of that kind and just go on present evidence. Look, if my beard went purple, pink, who would know? You would know because you've got it darn thing, haven't you? You're the one with the white beard. You, can, you know how the light falls... I mean, in the studio, all sorts of funny lights around. I have no idea what it looks like, this face. It's your problem, Michael. And um, your, your face is my problem, and we're trading faces. And you can see that absence there of anything. Keep me out with the greatest of ease. Now, the, the, the viewer there, I mean, I, I appeal to you, the viewer, uh, whether this isn't true. I mean, you've got Douglas's face here in all its detail. I promise you, I don't have that darn thing. It's yours, and you can see the, uh, you know, the all sorts of things here which are hidden from me, because you have my face, and uh, I have Michael's face, he has my face, and Crippen, uh, I am full of you at this time, and so we are not confronting one another. You and I are not like that. It is non-confrontation, and it is what is given there is given to me, uh, that, tr that opaqueness called Michael is given to me in what Shakespeare calls my glassy essence and transparency. And Shakespeare got it right. Not only do I see you, do I have your face, but your face is probably going to be some reflection of the face that you see. In other words, if, if my face did turn, if my beard did turn blue at this moment, it's likely that I would see you raising your eyebrows at my appearance. Yeah, but you, if wouldn't I, know. If you wouldn't I, know what I had seen, would you? No, but I, I would obviously have some, it would be a reflection of what of you were thinking about me. Therefore, if, does this state of seeing, of placing your face where my face used to be, actually 
uh, have an effect upon you. Dave. Well, that's all secondary stuff. Mm. I'm talking about <coughs> what we're looking out of. And uh, I, I mean, certainly, uh, I see reactions to old Douglas in the world, and I deduce that they may be seeing something here that's not revealed to me, like his beard. Uh, but it's all very secondary. You see, I think that the, the answer to the whole question of creativity is self-knowledge. It is self-realization. It is seeing where we're coming from. And that is, that is the, the secret of everything. The secret of creativity is the secret of non-confrontation. So we're not confronting one another. We're built open for one another. It's, it's the secret of creativity. It's the secret of energy. Uh, because, uh, I mean, the, 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 the energy is available from here. Because when I hallucinate something here to keep cribbing and, and you out with, that's so de-energizing, it's so tiring. And I think Shakespeare's enormous energy in producing all those plays in such a short time, acting in them, producing them, and incredible creativity, it's an incredible energy. Where did it come from? It came from who he really was, because he wa and because he wasn't using it up, put, putting Shakespeare's face here. And that, that uh, uh, thing in Measure for Measure gives the clue. And other plays, another place in his works, he talks about being eased, to we be eased by being nothing or no thing. And here I am no thing, but I'm awake. No thing for everything. And I can see that. So let's do a little experiment. I mean, we go on talking, talking, talking. Can we do a little experiment, do you think? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's very important. And I think we have, we've got a nice tool here for indicating this place uh, where Mm, our energies rise, uh, where we're coming from, what we're looking out of, uh, who we really, 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 really are, the source of all creativity. Uh, we have a tool for indicating uh, its location, for pointing it out. So if, um, if, we could, if, 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 if we could all just point uh, if you were, if you would just point to what you're looking out of now uh, you'll see I think there that you're looking out of space and the space that you're looking out of is filled at the moment with Douglas's face and if you turn to Michael it would be filled with Doug Michael's face and then with Crippen's face and for myself I look here and I see I am space for my two friends here. And I count, on present evidence, I count uh, uh, the people here sitting in chairs, and how many do I find? It's such so funny, isn't it? It's such a joke, really. So amusing. I find two and a half people. One, Cribben, all there, top to toe, and um, my friend Michael, all there, top to toe, and Douglas, you know, he's there up to here, and here he stops. So there are two and a half people down there for us. For you, there are three people. For you, there are three people. For me, there are one, two and a half. And when you were very little, a little child counting the people in the room, always leaves himself out because he's too sane, you see, to, to include himself because he is space for the others. And if he counts himself in, it's like counting the, the fruit bowl in with the fruit. But Douglas, how uh, would you counter the objection that the space that I'm seeing, which I do see when I dare to look, dropping thinking and belief and imagination as you yeah. um, ask us to do, I see um, everything solid, um, tangible, perishing out there. When I turn into myself, looking here, I see space, um, an awake. awake space. But how would you counter the objection that this might simply be um, an optical illusion within this top knot, within the head, an optical illusion of the brain? Well, and therefore, I, finally, it is still limited. I would answer this in two pieces. Uh, this way, first of all, uh, I swear to you that in my experience, Douglas stopped 
just about here. He got, this is where he stops. He comes to a finish. And uh, above this is the studio and the, and the camera there and uh, the viewer representing uh, the camera, or the camera representing the viewer, I should say. And, and above here is Gribben and, uh, and uh, Michael. And uh, I, 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 you say, Douglas, that's absurd, because we, we, we can see a top knot. We can see an old guy, an old Englishman of 85 here, you see. And uh, he, he's just uh, senile or something, you see. <laughs> he's just in third childhood or something. I swear there's nothing here. And uh, if you don't believe me, Gribben, come and see. Because you're too far away to know what's here. You're getting my regional appearance at what? Four, five feet. Four and a half feet. You're getting my regional appearance. And my, Mike is getting my appearance at about three feet plus. And these are, I'm, I'm surrounded by appearances. And I look in my mirror and see what I appear like where you are. Of course I've got a head, of course I've got a brain and a face and all that stuff. But I don't keep it here, I keep it where you are and, your, and where the, 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 your camera there reveals it to be. And so uh, if you want to take a photograph of Douglas, and by Douglas I mean from there I suppose it would mean his, his uh, torso, wouldn't it? It would mean his top half. If you want to take a photograph of Douglas, uh, you take it from there. And uh, you've got this, this lot here. Now, uh, you're quite a long way away, and I promise you, you, you're, you're, you haven't got a clue what it's like here yet. I invite you to come nearer. And as you come nearer with your camera, get to where Michael is, you're getting, say, my face in the camera, which is exactly where I find it in the mirror. And, you know, mirrors and cameras have a bad reputation, especially mirrors, but that's very unfair. It's humans that are stupid and tricky. Mirrors and cameras don't lie. But humans lie like whatever is, you know, lie, lie like the devil. They really do. So anyway, you, 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 want to, you want to find out what my face is like, you hold your camera there. Now you're still a long way away, and you come in and you get a photograph of my nose. Now, a nose isn't Douglas, it isn't a human being, it's a nose, or a cheek, or an eye, or lips. It's still a long way away, and you uh, come nearer with your camera, and then you start fitting optical uh, equipment, sophisticated lenses. More, uh, mag you magnify the image with uh, optical and then uh, electronic uh, microscopes, and you come in, and then your story is that the uh, skin it reveals itself to be a system of skin cells, which are little living creatures, and not human. Uh, they're coloured and they're alive, but they're not human. And you come in further, and you find that the cell is revealed to be molecules. Well, molecules aren't even alive. Uh, some are very complicated, like DNA. And, but it's still a long way away, and you come to a molecule, and then you come in further, and the molecules are resolved into atoms as you approach. This is all can be done in a laboratory in, in this university. And uh, the uh, molecules are resolved with much more sophisticated uh, equipment and so forth, resolved into atoms which are almost empty space. You still haven't got here. And then the, I mean, atoms are really, really empty, aren't they? As empty as solar system, or more so. And uh, then the story, you know, becomes vaguer and vaguer. The story is of great space, unlimited space, energy is pulsating away there, and you can't even locate uh, those centers of energy because they are very elusive. And uh, you come to a region which is said to be inhabited by little guys called quarks. And I don't think even God knows what a quark is. And in other words, on your way up here, you have lost me absolutely. You've come to almost nothing. Now, I complete the story. And I say, you're quite right, but you can't quite make it to here. 
I complete the story and I find nothing here. And that nothing is awake to itself. And nothing which is awake to itself is quite something, or to put it rather crudely, mm. quite extraordinary. So that's the first half of my answer. And the second really flows from it. Of course I've got brain, of course I've got a head, of course I've got all face, all that kind of thing. Where do I keep the darn thing? I keep it out there in you now. I don't have it here. My face belongs to you. My face, and my face at this moment, viewer, belongs to you. I, I promise you I don't have that darn thing. And you're welcome to it. Partly you're welcome to it because its, it's, it's shelf life has almost run out. Come on, 85, how long has this, that face got? You see? I look at my mirror and say, thank God I'm not like that here. That perishing thing. Well, I, there's no thing here which is awake to itself. Uh, the um, seat and origin of creation is imperishable. It's everything I need. So, uh, uh, it, it, it just makes sense. I mean, this is rational and is implicit in the very uh, mode uh, of science itself. In, to put it more generally, you go up to what, it, what you go up to, you lose. And I go all the way up to myself. I lose myself and I get the universe. So what you um, in effect are saying is that this business of thinking, of thinking myself to be in the brain, I think it's perhaps a nice way of, of putting it, is actually an optical illusion. That That's is, it. That is the optical illusion. It is. Of course I've got a brain, where do I keep it? I mean, when a brain surgeon operates on me, trepanning and making holes and digging in scalpels, where does he stay? He doesn't come here. He wouldn't get a brain here because he, he's, he's gone beyond the brain region. He stays here where he's in receipt of my brain. And as we, See, if I had a plastic thing here, Instead of a hairdo, I had a nylon, you know, no, what would it be, perspex, perspex cranium. And I look at the mirror and say, well, that's where I could meet my brain, you see, and behind that perspex uh, box. That's where I keep my face. That's where I keep it over there, in you, for you, for the brain surgeon. But if the brain surgeon comes nearer, he leaves the brain behind, and he, he, he's in receipt of brain cells. And he comes nearer still in, in, in receipt of molecules. What use are they? Out here to operate on me, he's got to stay there, hasn't he? Um, what seems to be um, the elegance of this, um, Douglas, is that in one stroke you actually, I see that I am you. And Mom. I'm Douglas, and I'm the camera people out here, yeah. and uh, the cat and the dog, and. So there's a wonderful sense of, of all being contained within the awareness. And this is, this Gribbon is discoverable at the heart of all the great religions. Now, it doesn't make it true uh, that this is, happens to be the perennial philosophy, the uh, message which you can unearth, buried under all sorts of junk from all the great religions. It doesn't make it true, but it makes it worth investigating in case it's right. And uh, in my experience, it's absolutely, absolutely right. That who you really, really, really are at centre is this awakeness, the I am, if you like, this nameless awakeness, which is as wide as the world, had no limits, is, is absolutely empty this way and absolutely full of the world that way, and uh, is uh, awake to itself as no thing, everything. And that when I see who I am here, which is that I see who you are, because there's nothing here at the moment. There's a place I'm pointing at, has no Douglas marks on it. And this awakeness is universal, and it'll do very nicely, thank you very much for Cribben, and for Michael, and for the viewer. So, uh, I don't know the viewer, I don't know much about your appearance, in fact I know nothing about your appearance, but my gosh, uh, I do know who you really, really are, and I've, how do I discover who you really, really are? I don't do it by peeking into the camera, or if you were present in the studio, I wouldn't do it by peeking into the, the pupils of your eyes. Where should I look then? I should look here. Because what I find here is this awake space, uh, uh, as wide as the world, 
with no Douglas marks on it, you see, which is what Shakespeare called my glassy essence. And this really is transparent, and you can't write on it. It has no name. You can't stick labels on it. And so when I see who I am, I have entree, I have insight into who you are, who Cribben is, who Michael is, who everybody is. And when I see who I am, the, bound, the, 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 the barriers are down. Now this seems this and I am you. Here, when I am who I really, really am, I am you. My appearance is different from you. Cribben's appearance and Douglas' appearance and Michael's appearance and your appearance to the world, uh, those are all different. But we are looking out of the same glassy essence, are we not? And here we, we are one. And what is our anguish in life is separation, lack of communication, lack of creativity, uh, loneliness, alienation. And what is the cure? The cure is to come back to a place we never left and see that though I see it out there, I'm Douglas, which I present to the world. That's, my, that's what he gives to the world, a little old Douglas thing there. And I hope it doesn't do the world too much harm. But uh, what, what I am here is totally different from that. And here I'm you, and the barriers are down. And that's the end of alienation. And it gives love a chance. Put it another way, my uh, Cribben, we are busted wide open for each other. I have nothing here to keep you out with. And viewer, you have surely now, you have nothing there to keep Douglas out with. I mean, you wouldn't be able to be in receipt of this, all this beer and all this stuff here and my um, thing here, which I acquired here, as you can see in Denver. You couldn't take that in unless you uh, were empty for it, could you? Well, that is your glassy essence. That is your, who you really, really, really are. Awake capacity at the moment for, for old Douglas. And, uh, of course, awake capacity for the whole world. Now, when you contact that, uh, and it's, it's where you're coming from, in fact, you don't have to contact it. You are it. What you do is stop lying that you're, about, that you're a solid but meatball there. <laughs> I mean, we got this crazy fiction when we joined the human club that mounted on our shoulders, we've got, got a meatball. I've got no meatball here. Or if I have a meatball, it's the whole universe. And, and uh, 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 I look in the mirror, that guy in the mirror's got a meatball mounted on his shoulders. I didn't gang God, I look like that. Not here I'm not. And people who assume that they're living out of a solid seven-inch meatball here, they never tell me what it's like, Cribben. They don't say, uh, it, it won't go into it. It's actually, I say, is it dark in there? Is it wet? Is it seven inches across? Oh, it must be. Where are you in this meatball? Are you, are you peeking through both little windows simultaneously? I mean, it's a, the whole thing is just not investigated. But we can see what we're looking out of, can't we? It's the easiest thing in the whole world to see what we're looking out of. I can see its base for the world to happen in. It's a secret of creativity. It's a secret of non-confrontation. Because I've nothing here to confront you with. It's not like that. It's like that. And it's, um, it gives love a chance. Because it sees that we are built open, busted wide open. And this gives love a chance. Douglas, you've got a, a nice little experiment which I would like you to do uh, that shows us and will show the viewer exactly how we hallucinate things, make things up. Oh, that one? Yes. Oh, yes. Well, this is a very simple experiment and I, I hope it will work with you. And I tried it on, on um, Cribben and... Um, well, I think actually it worked with you. Yes, it did work. It worked when... It, 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 yes, it more or less worked with you too. I wonder whether it would work with the viewer. It's very really interesting. The purpose of this experiment, let me explain, is uh, to see how difficult it is to see what we see. We do not see what we see, we see what uh, we are told to see, what we think we see. And um, I've uh, tried this experiment with hundreds, thousands of people really. I promise you that they nearly all it works very nicely with almost all of them. And what I'm going to do 
is to hold up uh, the card for, for, for you and the friends in the studio here to see. And uh, if you will read, uh, read out to yourself uh, what you perceive to be written here on the card, and then uh, I shall read out uh, my version of it, and you tell me, you tell me, oh, I did, I, you, you know, it's up to you then to see whether I got it right. Have I read out what is on the card or not? So uh, here it is. Read it very carefully, very carefully. I think friends in the studio here doing his camera work could do that. It's very interesting for them, I think. And you can have another look here. Now, I'm going to read out a version of it, and it's for you to say whether I'm doing it right or not. Reading out what's actually on the card. Do you see what you see or what you want to see? Do you see what you see or what you want to see? Is that what's written on the card? Do you see what you see or what you want to see? Well, have another check. Well, you may have got it right or you may not, and just in case you have uh, made a mistake and uh, uh, suppose that Douglas read out correctly what was on the card, I'm going to just do a check it up with you. And when I point to a word here, will you yourself say that word out loud to yourself or whisper it if you like. So I'm going to hold up the card and I'm going to point to each word in turn and you whisper what you find there. I think last time we tried it in the Durban area, I think about Three people out of 35 have got it, didn't they? Yes. Three out of 35. And I, at home in Nacton, where I live in England, we had this written up on the door, the toilet, you see, inside. So people had ample opportunity to look at it. And uh, one friend uh, looked at it for, for hours, for ages and ages, and eventually copied it down. And still she couldn't see <laughs> the duplication. We, we do not see what we see. We see what we think we see or what we're told to see. And one of the things that we, which is, it doesn't matter about that, but it is damaging to hallucinate something here to keep Cribben out with, hallucinate a block here to keep Michael out with, to hallucinate something here to, to keep you out with. So I say, keep out, keep out. I've got one. I have nothing here in your way, viewer, absolutely nothing in your way. And I think you have nothing in my way. And we're not confronting, we're not face to face. It is, it is face to space, 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 face to space. And it's not confrontation, it is like that. Each busted wide open for the other, which means that we are built uh, for non-confrontation, we're built for loving. Now, I'm not talking about the feeling of love and sentimentality uh, and all that. I'm talking about the, 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 the ground, the basis from which love can grow naturally. But coming back to, of course, coming back to our main topic of inspiration, where does the inspiration come from? Does it come from that guy in my mirror that confronts you know, that's a solid thing there for keeping you out with. Does my inspiration come from that? This one has no resources. This one's a picture. It's just like a picture of Uncle George on the wall, isn't it? The thing is, the guy in the mirror is not me. It's a picture. A picture of that range. Varying from the nearer pictures, varying from the further pictures. 
It's not who I am, and it has no resources. But this one here, when you look at, you know, you really look at where you're coming from, what the resources of this are infinite. And it goes on and on forever. A glassy essence of transparency. And I say it is the source here of everything, absolutely everything, and above all of the new, of the creative. Uh, sorry, yeah, I, I just have a quick, uh, an idea that what you hang in there isn't even your own face as you look in the mirror very often. If you're a child and you watch Fl Fred Flintstone on television every Friday after new, new, noon, you may hang there the face of a character from the television show. If you, if you watch a lot of advertising and you identify with the Marlboro Man, you may hang the face of the Marlboro Man here. And you may, if you go to a, f a film and you see a hero, you may walk out and you may be that person. Have you ever felt that? If you go to yeah. a movie and you really yeah. identify with somebody, when you come out, you feel you act as though you, you were that person. Imitative. Yes, yes, yeah, you feel as though you are that person. Yes. So it's not necessarily, it's just the hanging of any impression of yourself that yes. is that is stereotyped in any way at all, which yes. is the danger. Yes, well, I mean, I'm space for that face, but I'm space for all the other faces too. And uh, I'm certainly influenced by every face that fills my space. And I'm grateful for it because it needs, uh, it needs filling, doesn't it? Transparency is no good without, the space is no good without the filling. But uh, you can get hooked on one piece of filling. And mm -hmm. in fact, the, the, the whole world is available. The world of every, the, the whole, all the creatures in the world, all the people in the world are there uh, ready to fill out your space. What about the person who says, all right, Douglas, I, I get the point about not only looking outward, which has been the human condition thus far, but also turning inward so there's a, a two-way looking, as it were, and begin to see the point of going beyond the identification with uh, the image of oneself and actually being the no-self. Yeah. But, you know, that's all well and good, but I'm stuck here with a whole host of, of uh, conditioned impulses, um, emotional uh, reactions, which all also make up me, in fact, in many, many uh, ways, are m much more powerful than a visual picture I might have of myself. So uh, someone comes in, into the studio and says, um, uh, the campus is burning down, as it was um, kind of yesterday, uh, which is another aspect of this whole uh, dialogue of creativity, finding a way into a non-violent self. But I hear that exclamation, there's a fire outside, and immediately you know, I, I, I become... Uh, I become my, my responses, I become racist, I become uh, angry, I become bitter, I become all those things that might um, imp propel me into all kinds of very foolish actions. Now how do I deal with that cluster of um, responses at the emotional uh, level, it's, and, and which also become part of the, uh, the organism? Yes. Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, we need to limit uh, uh, our inquiry to uh, uh, what that inquiry is, is about and not uh, introduce uh, importance to the situation, other considerations, until we've uh, uh, looked at this particular point which we're investigating. And I was investigating the physical thing here. Am I open to you or not? It leaves, as you rightly say, the question of, uh, my uh, negative uh, and indeed positive feelings, thoughts, mm. and so on, unresolved uh, so far. But having got the physical facts right, now we can proceed to that uh, mind stuff. And uh, uh, I find, uh, 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 when I really look here, I find here capacity, just like capacity for you know, the shape of your face, I find capacity for the colour of your face. I find uh, capacity or uh, room for your opacity, 
and to my transparency here. Now, in the world, uh, Cribben, I have all sorts of ideas about, about Cribben. I've got known him for the last uh, 12 days and uh, come to know him. And when I, I look at you, my, you know, all sorts of ideas and memories and uh, 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 conversations we've had, you have become, uh, for me, not just uh, an idea living, uh, I don't know how many thousand, a gentleman living, I don't know how many thousand miles away from me in England. You've become a real person, clothed with all sorts of feelings and thoughts. And so it is with the whole world. The world comes to me clothed with, with meaning, with um, some of it's frightening, some of it's cruel, some of it's beautiful, some of it is repulsive. The whole world is structured, uh, or shall I say, uh, the whole world is for me um, enlivened, enriched, decorated, and uh, uh, elaborated uh, with all the st that mental stuff. In other, other words, it's full of meaning, it's full of uh, uh, color, um, uh, inspiration, uh, so sadness, or, uh, joy, beauty, ugliness, uh, truth, falsity. The whole thing is going on out there. What I don't find a necessity to do is to take certain aspects of this rich, very decorative world and to, to take mental stuff from it here and put it in a thing called mind box here. So I, I find my mind is uh, kind of distributed over the world and it's an artificial um, uh, device uh, we've been engaged in this uh, endeavor and had its use um, for the last, you know, notably in the last two or three hundred years, is to take the, all that mental stuff out of the world and put it into a thing here called a mind. And I think the great uh, Zen masters and uh, meditation masters of the world have seen through the, the, this trouble. It's a trouble because this mind stuff is not here as, as separate from the world. It just, it, 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 it is creative of the world. The mind stuff is, is an aspect of this creativity we're talking about. And it infuses, enriches, and reveals the world. And th these masters have said, well, nonsense, nonsense it is to take all that mind stuff from here and put it here. So the color is no longer in the, in the world. I contribute the color. In the world, you just have a lot of little uh, particles agitating about in, in the world. You, have you don't have beauty in the world anymore. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Uh, everything, a sound, uh, the, the world is silent, and the sound is here. You see, it's an interpretation of a certain um, waves here. And so on. So the, the end result of that is the world becomes just absolute and total artificial uh, nuts and bolts. Unthinkable, really, with a world without any qualities, whatever. And it's, it's a world, a miserable, I mean, an absurd world. And I'm here so full of all that blasted mental stuff, I've got to go to a psychiatrist and let some of the darn stuff out. Well, I don't have to let it out because it belongs in the world. And the masters I, that I value are do, do, absolutely clear about this. The idea of a personal mind here is hell in the end. So, sorry, but you're working with, one is working with, what you have, what is, at, what is in the world. If I know a lot about you, and if I know the points about which you may be sensitive, and I know the points about which somebody else might be sensitive, and I'm aware of a sensitive historical context to uh, the, the, the environment in which I find myself, I won't, if I'm being creative again, I won't set you off against this person. In other words, Create, that would be destructive. I would then be in a position to be destructive. But if I am empty, then I will try to delight the world. I will try to. I will be. I will be aware of the things that I, well, I, that I shouldn't say in order to offend. Well, we could have put it like this: that in the world, uh, as so constituted, the essence of the world is uh, it's uh, the contrast here, the ding-dong, 
uh, between the positive and the negative, the true, the false, the beautiful, the ugly, the left, the right, the inseparable, this division. And the world runs on strife, it does, runs on this ding-dong. On polarity. Uh, and polarity. And you see, the, the, this right hand is a judge, rather poetically, to contain the good things of the world. The dexter hand, the sinister hand, are the nasty thing. And the world is like that. And I, I notice in the world uh, these uh, contrasting uh, polarities, negative and positive poles of a battery. What is the reconciliation of them? It is, you see, it forms a triangle like that here, and the resolution is the apex of the triangle, which is this glassy essence, which contains both, and holds them together in a creative unity rather than a destructive unity. Mm. D Douglas, we have just a few minutes left. Um, could you be, perhaps conclude with a way to um, make this seeing um, an ongoing uh, practice so, so, so that it becomes um, a part of our lives, that, so that we are actually um, are the awareness that, 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 that holds the left and the right. Um, yeah. And so that we don't, we're not fixated with the identification uh, of the little chap in the mirror. Uh, How we can live from uh, the place we are living from, live from our true identity, which is this eternal awakeness, uh, glassy essence, imperishable, creative, who we really, really are, and which joins us to everybody. How can we get out of the old habit of being separate, you know, identifying with the little separate guy in the mirror? Yes. How can we shift our center of gravity from that little guy in the mirror to the one here and cease being eccentric? But we're very little, we're right here. And then we join the human club and we are there, looking at ourselves from there and become darned eccentrics. How can we cease to be set concert, uh, sit, how can we cease to be eccentric and become concentric? So this is our lifestyle, we're living consciously from who we are and from our creative essence. And the answer to that, I think, very clear, it takes some, it, it's, it's terribly easy to see this, isn't it? Terribly easy to see how different uh, you are a space from anything you are taking in. But to habituate that, to make this your style, your lifestyle, isn't easy. And we have to practice it. It's all a matter of practice. And uh, it's a help to have problems. Because problems out there, I find, bring me back to here where there are no problems. If I have a problem with Cribben, and he's being nasty to me, he never has been, but he might be, uh, what, what is the solution of that? I come back here to see I'm space for Crippen who's being a little bit difficult now. And he's bringing me back here. Everything brings me back here. I put on my spectacles here. I see two little windows there and I put them on and they become one. They go home on any vehicle. Any vehicle. This is a very nice vehicle for coming home on. Well, I, I think the big reminder is and we can practice this all day and every day, and it lubricates personal relationships no end. It is to see, when there's somebody in front of you, to see you are built open for that one. And you see, viewer, you can see that uh, you are open for Douglas. It's not because you're a very nice person. You're built open for me because you've no option. And you keep, you keep this uh, uh, going in all your personal relationships and you see that whatever face you have here, it's space at your end. And you, viewer, I suggest you, you as this is a joke really, you've never, never, never been face to face symmetrically with anyone in your whole life. It's always been face to space. Now, that is a big reminder. We're all concerned with personal relationships, aren't we? all the time, and our lives run, you know, on that uh, uh, kind of fuel. So we must stop and hallucinating. Uh, stop hallucinating, that's it. Stop hallucinating something here to keep people out with. And then it's the end of confrontation. And we see we are busted wide open for one another. And we are giving love a chance. I would say, really, the surprise, in spite of all the nonsense and violence and cruelty of the world, the truth, the underlying truth is that we're built for loving. We really are. We're built to give our lives for one another. 
The only way I can take in my dear Cribben here is to vanish as Douglas. And the only way he can take in his friend Douglas is to vanish as Cribben. No, it's that courteous thing, isn't it? It's also creative, just in that, because you're creating... Well, it's, 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 you're it's creating the essence Cribben. of creativity. You're really. creating Cribben. I really am, you see, and he's creating Douglas. And you're, is that is the creativity par excellence, really. Mm. Mm. Like Shakespeare created all that, you know, huge gallery of mm. um, characters. characters and it's similar. Yeah. I mean, it's not different in, in, in principle mm. there. Cribben is creating his Douglas, and I'm, you know, there we are, living from our glassy essence. Yes. Ah, oh, but we have to plan to your point. These are so important. Enjoying this and having a bit of fun, and, and so serious it too, is, is great. But, uh, you know, to make it work in our lives, so that we are really being creative, enjoying our life, and, and getting the energy that comes from who we are. Uh, we need to practice it. And this practice is not a miserable old uh, hard grind, you know, uh, so down and so on. It is it, great fun, and it lubricates uh, the wheels of our life, and particularly is uh, helpful in the, in the not inconsiderable business problems of personal relationships. Douglas, we've come to the end of this dialogue. It uh, remains for me to thank you formally on behalf of the university community of the University of Devon Westville uh, for having responded to our invitation to visit us for these past two weeks where you've um, held workshops and given talks and indeed brought a great many people to a perception of who we really are. And for this, I extend um, personally my utmost gratitude to you. And I'd like to thank Michael, who has uh, given me the moral support um, in getting you down. Uh, at some time, at times it was um, a bit hazy in my mind that we were going to pull it off, but uh, we did, and we really think, please, that we can all be here together to have this uh, dialogue. Uh, to the viewer, I'd like to say that uh, Douglas Harding is the author of four very popular books in the Arcana series published by Penguin, which um, amplifies uh, Douglas' teachings and indeed brings to together a whole host of experiments that we can try for ourselves in bringing us back to who we really are. Uh, the books um, are On Having No Head, The Little Book of Life and Death, Head of Stress, and a, remark a remarkable didactic novel entitled The Trial of the Man Who Said He Was God. Thank you very much. <laughs>